OK, let's talk about these questions. We did number one last week, so if you forgot, you can go and watch the video for last week. Number two, mercy, pity, peace and love. Why are they so repeated in this poem? To mercy, pity, peace and love, all pray in their distress. And to these virtues of delight, return their thankfulness. OK, so yes, these four are good things. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God, our Father, dear, and mercy, pity, peace, and love is man, his child, and care. Okay, so now we have a religious perspective. For uh, mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. So here it's saying that humans already have these four virtues. Then every man of every clime, clime means climate, qi ho, that prays in his distress, prays to the human form, divine love, mercy, pity, peace. Okay, so there's a kind of argument here, right? When you pray for these things, you're praying to God, but God and man are uh, connected, and so these four things are also in humans. So when you pray, you're actually asking humans for help. And all must love the human form in heathen, Turk, or Jew. Heathen means non-Christian. Where mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. Okay, so it's saying when you're praying for these things, you're actually asking humans for help. So it looks like humans can give mercy, pity, peace, and love to each other. If that's true, why is there still so much suffering? If we can all solve our own problems, why are there so many people still praying for mercy, pity, peace, and love? Also, line 17, all must love the human form in heathen, Turk, or Jew. Everyone must love every other human, no matter what they believe in. Why does the poem say we must? Does that mean that there are many people who don't? Are there many Christians who actually don't uh, behave like human beings toward other people of different religions? And then one last point, mercy, pity, peace, and love, right? These four keep getting repeated, but notice the last time, mercy, love, and pity. Where's peace? Is perhaps this poem suggesting that peace is the hardest thing to reach. The whole poem feels like it's a it's a cry for help for everybody. It's like a, a cry of the heart, Xingling the Nahan. There's no real action that the poem wants us to do except like love everybody, which is very vague. So why does the poem keep repeating these four virtues? Maybe, as one group said, because the speaker of the poem doesn't know what else to do. It's obvious that the speaker feels like there are many problems in society. And that maybe these four virtues can help us solve these problems. And the poem even says all of these virtues are in humans so we can solve our own problems but how what should we do the speaker doesn't know either so maybe re repeating is a cry for help so they chojo number 3 do you think the poems of Songs of Innocence are really innocent? If not, how can you tell that they are not innocent? So in other words, what are the darkness parts of the first five poems? This is a very popular question today, um, and everyone found some different dark aspects. I'm just going to collect all of your observations. So we just talked about the divine image, why this may not be a peaceful, loving poem, but could be a cry for help. Last week, we talked about this chimney sweeper, these kids, poor little kids working as chimney sweepers, 
uh, I did not spend a lot of time on this, but these two stanzas are the dream of little Tom Dacker. He goes to bed and he dreams that an angel unlocks him and the other kids from their coffins, Guan Cai, and they go leap and play, wash in a river and become clean, and finally rise upon clouds, play in the wind. Basically, they get to enjoy everything good in life and go to heaven. And then he wakes up. And real life is not like that. He has to go back to work cleaning chimneys. OK, Holy Thursday. So here are some details we can pay more attention to. The children walking two and two. Gray headed beetles walked before before here means in front. And the footnote tells us that beetle is a lower church officer, so it's an officer of the church, somebody who works for the church. So these are children walking in rows of two and two led by a church official. Till into the high dome of Paul's, Paul's is a cathedral, Da Jiaotang, Paul's Cathedral. They like Thames waters flow. Thames is a river, Tai Wu Sihe. So there are so many of these children that they are like a river. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, what a crowd. Thousands of little boys and girls. OK, think about this. It's a Thursday. Thousands of children are squeaky clean in their best clothing, on their best behavior, walking orderly and quietly and singing into a church behind a church official on a Thursday. So first of all, where are their parents? And secondly, why is this happening on a weekday and not a Sunday? So if you were able to read my notes, you would maybe get an answer to the first question. Where are their parents? Cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door. So here angel is probably talking about these little kids. To drive an angel from your door means to like shoo away an angel from your door. So why would children come to your door in the first place? So maybe this whole situation is these are all orphans. Those are gore. Thousands and thousands of orphans. And the church is responsible for taking care of these orphans. But with so many, they probably can't handle all of them. So they're trying to encourage people to adopt these children. So what is this event? It's an event to present all of these little angels and hope that somebody will adopt them. So call to adopt, showcasing orphans at their best. And so this gets us to think, why are there so many thousands of orphans? What happened to their parents? Let's take a short break and then we'll continue with the darkness.
Okay, let's look at the next one. Nurse's song. Where is the darkness in this one? As one group observed, this poem is children playing on the hill, and the nurse is the woman who is taking care of them. So it does not mean a medical nurse, like more like a babysitter. Stanza two, then come home, my children, the sun is gone down and the dews of night arise. So it's getting dark. Stanza three, no, no, let us play for it is yet day. Yet means still, it is still day. And we cannot go to sleep. Besides in the sky, the little birds fly and the hills are all covered with sheep. Well, well, go and play till the light fades away and then go home to bed. The little ones leaped and shouted and laughed and all the hills echoed. So the nurse is supposed to be taking care of these children. When the sun goes down, she has to take them home. But when the children say, no, we want to keep playing, she doesn't force them home. She says, OK, OK, but remember to go home when it gets dark. Ha ha ha. They probably won't listen to her. So as the group who chose this poem observed, the nurse seems to be remembering her own childhood. She's remembering when she was a child and she loved to play and never wanted to go home. At sunset, so here she lets the children be happy for a little while longer. But this same uh, inclination to give the children more happiness also puts them in more danger. After dark is when the animals come out. It's when the uh, like evildoers and criminals come out. Uh, and at this time also, like today, if you go out at night, all the street lights are very light and it's not hard to see things. But at that time, uh, electricity had not yet come to England. So at night, their lighting was gas lights. Very dark. Very dangerous. OK, infant joy. Next page. I have no name. OK, so look, there are quotation marks. Right, you in hall. So there are two people in this poem. Lines without quotation marks are the speaker. And lines with quotation marks are the addressee. So the addressee, I have no name. I am but two days old, but means only. I'm only two days old, not two years old, two days old. And the speaker says, what shall I call thee? OK, so the, these two people, the, the speaker and the baby, don't know each other. The speaker doesn't know the baby's name. So why are they talking to each other? The speaker is probably not the baby's parent, right? Because the speaker doesn't know the baby's name. So why would they be meeting? Why would they be having this kind of conversation? So one group. That's a very creative answer. I, I think that could also uh, work on a symbolic level. So one group just said that maybe this baby is actually uh, has already died and is now an angel coming. Uh, but that still brings us back to the original question. Why is the angel taking the form of a two day old baby? What situation does this look like? And one group who chose this poem said maybe the baby has been abandoned at the door of the speaker. So the speaker wakes up in the morning, opens the door and sees a baby lying there. Uh, and this is something that happened often when a family was too poor to take care of yet another new baby, but was not willing to just kill the baby. So they left it on the doorstep of like a rich person or like a church person and hope that this person would take care of their child. 
Um, so in terms of symbolism, earlier in Holy Thursday, we saw that orphans were called angels. Um, and so here maybe uh, we could say that religious people believed um, God sometimes would test them. And one test could probably be presenting a baby on your doorstep and seeing how you would treat this baby. So, and then like the baby's name is Joy, which is very ironic. So those are the five poems I chose from Songs of Innocence. And as we can see, all of them have some kind of darkness behind their stories. Uh, one group mentioned maybe they are called Songs of Innocence, not because they are all lovely and kind stories, but because they are stories told from the perspective of the young children who don't really understand darkness yet. So to them, it all looks like normal life, but we older people know that this is not normal at all. Question four. So a lot of these poems have similar or same titles, but why is the human abstract not called the human image? So we have the divine image, Xiang. So why don't we have the human image? Why is it called a human abstract? So let's look at this poem. The human abstract. I am on page 23. Pity would be no more if we did not make somebody poor. If there were no poor people, we would not know what pity is. So poor people have to exist in order for us to have pity. And mercy no more could be if all were as happy as we. If everybody was equally happy, we wouldn't need to have, we would no longer have mercy. This logic seems kind of weird, right? Let's continue. And mutual fear brings peace. This seems like something from the Cold War. Right? If we fear each other, if we're afraid of each other, we will not attack each other, and therefore we will have peace. Till the selfish loves increase. So if we become more selfish than we are afraid, then maybe we would ruin the peace. Then cruelty knits a snare. A snare is like a trap. And spreads his baits with care. Bait, your. So if we get too much selfish love, we start. Uh, cruelty starts laying traps. He, he is cruelty. He sits down with holy fears and waters the ground with tears. Then humility takes its root, Chimbe, underneath his foot. So cruelty waters the ground with tears and upgrows humility. Soon spreads the dismal shade of mystery over his head. Dismal means like miserable. It's a bad thing. Mystery is capital M, Dashe M. Uh, so it's not just something you don't know. It's talking about religious mystery. And the caterpillar and fly feed on the mystery. So nature feeds on this I, religious idea of mystery. If God created the world, then all of nature is religious. And it bears the fruit of deceit, qiman, ruddy and sweet to eat. The fruit is sweet. Ruddy means red and healthy. And the raven, uya, his nest has made in its thickest shade. The raven lives in the thickest part of deceit. The gods of the earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree. Throw is through. 
the reason that we um, uh, the poet has omitted the U G H is because at that time this word was pronounced thorough. So he needed to cut off one syllable. Yes, and there you go. But really today we just say through. Sought through nature to find this tree. So all the gods, gods here means angels, tried to find this tree. But their search was all in vain. They couldn't find the tree. There grows one in the human brain. Where can you find it? In humans, not in the human soul, the human brain, the way we think. So before we try to make sense of this poem, does this feel like a positive poem? Or does it feel like a negative poem? It feels more negative, right? First, it tries to justify being poor and or peace people being poor and unhappy. Then it says peace is because of fear. Then it because then it says cruelty uh, waters the ground and grows a tree that looks like it has humility and looks like it promotes religion, but then it's full of deceit. And the raven, which is a bad omen, has a good lives in this tree. And the gods cannot find it. It is not available to God. But it grows in the human brain. And then like there's also a criticism of religion because cruelty sits down with. Holy fears, fears given to cruelty by religion. So like when religion says don't do this or you will go to hell, that kind of fear. So why is it called the human abstract and not the human image? Well, if you remember the divine image, it's full of pity, love, mercy and peace, these very vague ideas, but it doesn't say how to to achieve those ideas. It is only an image. But here this poem seems to be talking about how humans behave toward each other, how we often are afraid of each other and what kind of society and what kind of religion this can produce. So it's not an image. It's talking about the basic essence of humans, Jinghua. And that is probably why it's called the human abstract and not a human image. It's not what we want to do, but it's what throughout history we often have done. Uh, and as the footnote says, mercy, pity, peace and love are now represented as possible marks or targets for exploitation, cruelty, conflict and hypocritical humility. Wei Jingzi de Qianbei. Uh, in a sense, this is an even bigger opposite from the divine image. Like, for example, if the title is the same, right? The, the chimney sweeper and the chimney sweeper, Holy Thursday and Holy Thursday. They are often about similar situations from different points of view. But in this case, the so-called situation is all of human existence. Divine image gives us the ideal. The human abstract gives us the reality. It's a bigger opposite. Next question, what kind of experience do you think unites the poems of songs of experience? So let's look at these five or other four poems. We just looked at one of them. Page 22, Holy Thursday from Songs of Experience. Is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land? Babes, babies, reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurous hand. Usurous means charging high interest. So like the idea is, oh, you want me to help these starving kids? OK, but you have to pay me. Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many children poor. It is a land of poverty and their sun does never shine, and their fields are bleak and bare. Bleak just means like cold and unforgiving, negative image. And their ways, way means road, their journey, their road, 
are filled with thorns, jing ci. It is eternal winter there. For where'er the sun does shine and where'er the rain does fall, babe can never hunger there, nor poverty the mind appall. This is a very interesting conclusion. If you can see the sun, if you can feel the rain, you will never grow hungry because you can grow food. So in a land where so many children are going hungry, the poem seems to connect this with the lack of nature or the destruction of nature. So again, we're looking at the Industrial Revolution, although it's not only the Industrial Revolution. All the way back in the 16th century, London was burning so much coal, Meitan, that the air was more polluted than today. But with the Industrial Revolution, the air only got worse. So that's one poem. Let's look at the next one. The Chimney Sweeper, a little black thing among the snow crying weep weep in notes of woe. Note here is like rifu, infu, like music. Where are thy father and mother, say? One person says, and then the Chimney Sweeper says, they are both gone up to the church to pray. Because I was happy upon the heath, the heath is a kind of field, and smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. So because I was happy, my parents made me suffer. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think they have done me no injury. They think that I'm fine and are gone to praise God and his priest and king who make up a heaven of our misery. So it seems like it's a story of neglectful parents. Either they are religious and neglectful, or they are actually just poor and can't afford to take care of their child very well. But either way, the parents decide to ask God for help, to praise God. Uh, maybe they do other things to try to make money and raise their child, but we don't see that in this poem. Finally, look at the last line. Make up a heaven of our misery. Turn our suffering into a kind of heaven. Um, there are a few ways to understand this line. One way is that Christianity often says that the poor and the suffering people will be the first to enter heaven. So this logic turns poverty into a good thing after you die. Another way to think of this is that um, if the parents truly are very, very religious, then whatever happens in their life, they will think is a blessing from God. So even when they are suffering, even when their child is suffering, they go to praise God. And so they, uh, the parents behave like their suffering is given by God. It is a kind of heaven. So here, the child is also a chimney sweeper. We still have the Industrial Revolution. Um, but here we have the added idea of religion that doesn't really help. You might even say that religion does harm because the parents leave the child behind. And then, of course, you have the higher level symbolic reading. Maybe gone up to the church to pray actually means the parents are dead. Next one, nurse's song. When the voices of children are heard on the green, a green is like a field again, and whisperings are in the dale. A dale is a valley. Remember, this is England. They don't have very high mountains. They have hills and dales. They don't have mountains and valleys. The days of my youth rise fresh in my mind. My face turns green and pale. Wait, the nurse hears children. She remembers her youth, but her face turns green and pale. That's not a normal reaction, right? 
Then come home, my children, the sun is gone down and the dews of night arise. Your spring and your day are wasted in play and your winter and night in disguise. So you're wasting your spring and day playing and having fun and you're wasting your winter and night in disguise. So green and pale, green usually means jealousy. So it may be the nurse feels jealous of the children. And so out of spite, she tries to tell them that your childhood will end soon. You're wasting your time and that soon you will have to face growing up and dying. That's also very dark. So in this poem, the nurse's experience of childhood actually makes her suffer because it's something that she no longer has. She wants it and she no longer has it. And we looked at the human abstract. Infant sorrow, this is the opposite of infant joy. My mother groaned, singing. My father wept. Into the dangerous world I leapt. This is probably the darkest description of giving birth in English literature. My mother groaned, my father wept, and I was born into this dangerous world. Helpless, naked, piping loud, so like the baby was crying. Like a fiend hid in a cloud. A fiend is a devil, like a devil hid in a cloud. Struggling in my father's hands, Striving against my swaddling bands. Swaddling bands are like the blanket that you put a new baby into. So he's the baby is fighting against the blanket. Bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon my mother's breasts. So the baby finally calms down and drinks milk from its mother, not because it wants to, but because it has no other choice. It is stuck in the blanket crying is not changing anything and it is now weary or tired so the only thing the baby can do is to drink milk what a way to enter the world and it seems like the baby does not want to be born because it knows that the world is dangerous it already has some idea of experience of this world and it decides it's not a good world to live in. So what unites these five poems? It seems like experience of something that is actually happening, whether it is poverty or religion or growing old, seems to make these characters and these speakers suffer. It's like life is more negative than positive. Yeah, even in the human abstract, it's drawing from many years of human history, the patterns of history. So it seems like if we look at how humans actually behave and their actual situations at this time, the conclusion can only be suffering and that's why the infant is so sad it doesn't want to be born into this world okay question six how can you tell it was written in the romantic period so for this question we're going back to page 19 and looking at these ideas the industrial revolution very obvious everybody's working and dying young the French Revolution, it started because people were angry at the ruling class, at the people in power. People felt like those in power, the king and the nobles, did not care about ordinary people. Well, something similar can be said for England, except not just the king and nobles, but also like the rich people, the factory owners, the capitalists, Zibenja did not seem to care about ordinary people. Uh, and this is what led to the workers massacre of Peterloo in 1819. Workers trying to protest for their rights. 
the government sent the army to shoot them down. There is a movie made about this called Peter Lee. It's a long movie, so I can't show you in class. Uh, romanticism, spontaneous, creative imagination and feeling. Yes, these poems are all full of feeling. They are full of imagination. We have a two day old talking baby. We have like little chimney sweepers dreaming of freedom. Lots of imagination. Lyric poetry, which usually just means short poetry. True, right? These poems are all very short. Meditations on nature. OK, not a lot this time, but we do have the nurse's song, right? The children are playing in nature and the nurse either doesn't call them home or is jealous of these children. So there is some nature and the nature is very important when we see it. Everyday life, yes, these poems are all about the everyday life of ordinary working people. Supernatural. You could say that in these poems, religion is not just an abstract idea, except for the divine image. In that one, everything is abstract. Aside from that poem, in the other nine poems, religion is not just an abstract idea. They really do see angels in babies. They really do pray to God for help. They really do hope that God will help them and save them in a very illogical, supernatural way. Gothic, darkness and suffering. Yes, a lot of that. The public. Yes, these poems were written not for nobles. They were written for ordinary people to read and know that everybody could see their suffering, that they were not suffering alone. Popular criticism. If you combine the public with popular criticism, you get the idea of the reading public, everyday people who read literature, and news and essays, and they have ideas about what they read. In part, this is why Blake wrote these poems. He wanted to get people to pay more attention, to really think about this society that they created. Personal essay. It's not an essay, but it is very personal. Blake, he himself observed. He also was a worker. Uh, but he was not a low level worker, so he had some time to create his poetry. And then we talked about the Peterloo massacre. OK, so for these six, five questions, these five questions, do you want to ask anything or want me to repeat something? OK, OK, so um, next week I will we will talk about two poems by William Wordsworth. Um, let's see, the first one is I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, page 24. And then the second poem is called Lines. Composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour of July 13, 1798. The common title for this poem is Tintern Abbey. An abbey is a kind of church. It is not a it is not a poem about the church. The church doesn't even appear in the poem. Now, Tintern Abbey is a long, philosophical, difficult poem. But the good news is that the basic idea of this poem is the same as the basic idea of this very short poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. If you can understand the first poem, it will be easier to understand the second poem. That's why I put them together. So that's next week. And then uh, after talking about these two poems, I will introduce the midterm exam and the midterm exam will begin at the end of next class. Now for the rest of today, I'm going to introduce. The first unit of the final exam because we won't have time to do this next week. Uh, so now I will pass out the second handout.
let's introduce the Victorian era. It's called the Victorian era because the most important person in this time was Queen Victoria I. She came to power in 1837. Um, some people call this earlier period before Queen Victoria the Edwardian period because it was King Edward II. It's not important. He didn't do anything important. So the whole thing is often called the Victorian era. It's most of the 19th century. Many big changes happened during this time. In 1830, England got its first public railway, the first public railroad. Before this, there were short private railroads that did not connect with each other. Um, but with the first public railroad, we started to get a system of transportation that connected all of England, Scotland and Wales. In 1831, Parliament officially gained sovereignty over the monarch. The king at the time was William IV. So before this, the king had the most power. Whatever the king says, people in parliament would often follow. But in 1831, the king tried to do something so unpopular that parliament voted against him and decided to do something else. Uh, it had to do with choosing a prime minister. The king was more conservative. Uh, the country was more liberal, progressive. They wanted somebody else. And so the king had to listen to the people or else maybe there would have been another civil war. So starting from 1831, sovereignty in the UK now resides in parliament. Like in Taiwan, sovereignty belongs to the people. We have the power to vote on issues and the government has to listen. In the UK, sovereignty lies with parliament. Yes, they can hold a referendum, but their referendum is not legally binding. It's only to give suggestions to parliament. This, is a, this was a big issue during Brexit. In 1832, the first reform bill grants vote to lower middle class men. So before this, only people, sorry, only men with money and land could vote. Starting with the first reform bill, men without land and with only a little money could also vote. This is the beginning of a series of political reforms. There was then the second reform bill, the third reform bill, and at the end of everything, every adult could vote. But this is the beginning of that change. So in this period, women also started to gain some legal rights. They could now own a little money. They could now legally work for themselves. But they still could not vote. Women only gained the vote in the early 20th century in the UK. 1837, Queen Victoria becomes queen. 1847, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Jian Ai. Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Pao Shao Sanzhuang. These are very popular novels that people today still love to read. Uh, in fact, I'm a member of a book club, and our book club this month chose Jane Eyre. I myself have attended a book club with a few friends of mine. They have chosen Jane Eyre for some reason. It's 500 pages. Why would we want to? Anyway, 1850. Uh, sorry, so like these two are examples of popular novels in the Victorian era. The Victorian era was the era of the really fucking long novel. I mean like 1000 page long novels. And the reason they're so long is because they were first published in newspapers by the word. So the authors had a financial incentive to write as much as possible. And only after the whole story was finished would this would the complete novel be put together in one book and it would look like this really, really thick. Um, they were so thick that one popular name for these novels is the triple decker novel. The idea is um, 
for the reading public, they may not have enough money to buy the whole novel at the same time. So booksellers would cut the book into three parts and sell them separately. That's how big these novels were. And it, it, this also helped people save money. Instead of buying one copy for every person in the family, they can buy one copy for every three people and share uh, like the three parts of the novel, each person reading a different part at the same time. Uh, and then we also have very famous women novelists. Last time, the romantic period, I mentioned Jane Austen, Zen Austen, Pride and Prejudice, All My Yu Jin. But here we have more and more uh, women novelists. In 1850, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels published the Communist Manifesto in English. The original German was published in 1847. I'm sure you recognize this name, Marcus. This is Yin. Have you read this before? It's short, it's very short, and it's very easy to read. And it's very entertaining because Marx was not wrong about everything. Sorry, was not right about everything, but he was right about like 80%. The way that he analyzed how capitalists exploit workers, the way that a capitalist society creates values from how people work and the value does not belong to the workers, and how this creates human suffering, all brilliant analysis. Uh, and so workers at the time were already suffering. Marx gave them the ideas they needed to explain why they were suffering, and it helped workers to build a labor movement. 1851, the Great Exhibition was held in London. So uh, about like five years ago, there was also a, a world exhibition in, I think, Shanghai, right? Shanghai, Sijie Bulanhui. There is no organization that decides where to hold a world's exhibition or world's fair. Each country can decide for themselves. So a, a great exhibition or a world exhibition is basically a country saying, we're great. You should all come and see how great we are. And at this point, London, was the the center of the British Empire. It had the most advanced technology. It had the most wealth and money. It had treasures stolen from all over the world. And this is where they celebrated all of these. Let's call them achievements. It's a symbol of British power in the world. 1854, Charles Dickens publishes Hard Times, Jin Nan Shiku, Jin Kun Shiku, I can't remember the name. Charles Dickens, Dickens, the most famous male novelist of this uh, Victorian era. Hard Times was his first best selling novel. It was not his first novel, it is his first successful novel. Some of his books are hard to read, some of his books are even harder to read. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This is the beginning of a Charles Dickens novel called The Tale of Two Cities, Ji. It is not the whole sentence. The whole sentence goes for 25 lines. So again, really long novels, but they're very popular because people at that time, this is how they actually spoke. This is how they used the language. Dickens wrote about working people, middle class people. He wrote about readers, the same people who were reading his books. He wrote about people becoming rich and then losing all their money. He wrote about people who met the love of their life and the love of their life was stolen away because they did not have enough money. Just very uh, popular stuff. 1854 also saw the publication of Coventry Patmore's play The Angel in the House, first edition. This is not an important play. Nobody remembers this person. The reason I put it here is because the title is a famous phrase, The Angel in the House, Zhong the Tianshi. This is referring to married women or even just regular women. 
And this is the phrase that describes Victorian ideas about gender. Women are supposed to stay and take care of the house while men go out and deal with the world. It was not always like this. This idea really solidified, became fixed in this era. You might be surprised to learn that the early 20th century was more progressive than today. 20世纪初, 甚至比今天还要进步, History is not a straight line. It goes in circles. 1857, Parliament takes over administration of India. So before this, India was controlled by the British East India Company, uh, but Parliament at that time decided, you know what? That's too much power to give to one company. We'll take over. And so from that time, uh, the country, the government now controlled India. And it could do this with efficiency because empire was powered not just by armies and money, but also by technology. There was the transatlantic telegraph cable, telegraph, dianbao. So now you can send a message across the ocean and it will get there like immediately. And this helped to build the British Empire and the British Empire helped to build a web of global trade. And so you can buy things from all across the world. And that further promoted consumerism, xiaofeizhuyi. Now it's not just the newest thing, it's also the most exotic thing. So at the height of the British Empire, British people were filled with a sense of energy and ingenuity, the idea that they could solve any problem using their brains, their money, and their technology. So this was a time of optimism, a time where people believed in the idea of progress, and of utilitarianism, the idea here is we can help solve society's problems with money and technology and logic. If we do enough good things, society will improve. Uh, so today we don't really believe this very much. We know that some problems in society are so big that no one person or no one company can solve it. But the Victorians felt like they could do anything at this time. Later on, we will see by the end of the century, they felt very differently. 1859, Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, Wu Zong Ren Qi, was published. This, uh, of course, is the first idea, uh, popular presentation of evolution, Yan Hua Lun. So this period was also a period of scientific discoveries, major advances in biology, evolution, geology, uh, the tectonic plate theory, Di Kuai Shuo, history, uh, because they were just they were digging holes and finding new things in the past and in math. Very many advances in math. Do you guys remember high school math? Like uh, all of that came from the 19th century Victorian era. And you can see this in 1865 Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. What is this story about? Is it about a young girl who falls into a fantasy land where things have a different logic and she tries to make sense and finally she gives up and goes home? Or is it an example of how strange the new math is and how this new math does not make sense at all? Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, was a mathematician, has a shushuja. He wrote this story to show the public why they should be against the new math. And it was only later when his daughter fell in love with the story that it became a popular children's story. So speaking of children, in 1870, England had compulsory education, for children. So now they had primary school, secondary school, the whole thing. A uh, primary school, not secondary school. This idea came from uh, Prussia, 
Prussia, which was uh, the old name for Germany. So now that children were all being taught how to read and write and do basic math, more and more people started to enjoy reading and started to use language in their daily life. So this period, we have serialized novels. I just talked about this. You have argument essays, so not just personal essays, but essays about issues and topics and what should we do? How should we solve these problems? And you have the dramatic monologue. This is not drama. This is poetry. A monologue in drama is when a character says something very, very long. Uh, so a poet named Robert Browning had the idea to write a poem that looks like a monologue, 看起来像独白, but there's no play. 没有后面的小说, uh, so this is a kind of poetry, and we're going to read a few of these. 1878, electricity finally comes to England. Can you imagine life without electricity? They had to live without electricity all the way until 1878. 1886, another famous novel. Again, this is the period of the novel. Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You might recognize this, uh, because there's a Japanese manga version. Right? A doctor by day turns into a killer monster at night. Um, and it's a metaphor because at this time, the empire started to crumble. Different countries were now in rebellion against England. The solutions and creativity to solve problems did not work, created even more problems. So this novel is a reflection of how under the surface, famous doctor, inventor, under the surface, there is always a dark side, a killer monster. So when the empire is crumbling and when England is losing its worldwide power, its art turns inward. Fond de Sico is French. It means end of the century. Aestheticism, Weimei So this kind of art says the only important thing, is it useful? Don't care. Is it uplifting? Don't care, as long as it is beautiful. In 1888, the Roundhay Garden scene was filmed. This is often considered the first short movie. The birth of the movies was in 1888. In 1890s, you have comedy by Irish people like Oscar Wilde, Wang Erde, and George Bernard Shaw, Shaw Bo Na. They were comedies that also had social criticism because at this time, Ireland is part of England, but is still treated like a second quality uh, territory. And the period finally ends in 1901 when Edward VII becomes king. Um, so keep that in mind for after the midterm. Questions? All right, see you next week. <laughs>